It must have been about five o'clock in the afternoon and my phone started ringing. It was a news desk at the Al Jazeera headquarters in the United States, frantically trying to get hold of me because, as it turned out, just a few minutes ago, there'd been a massive earthquake in Haiti. I was the only reporter who was anywhere near the incident, so they were telling me to just get to the airport as quickly as I could. We got the first flight that we could get to the Dominican Republic, which is right next door to Haiti, and spent the next several hours trying to charter a small aircraft to fly us over the border to Haiti. The runway to the airport was apparently very badly damaged and there were no planes landing. We found one guy who agreed to take us. We paid him a bunch of money and just basically got on this four-seater aircraft, tiny little plane. He was radioing down to the ground to see if he could get anyone at all on the radio to say if it was safe to land or not. He couldn't contact anyone. When we landed, we were the only people there. We were some of the first journalists to actually arrive on the scene with a little camera and a few thousand dollars and you know, no idea what to do next. The airport was completely destroyed. There was a massive crack through the entire building. The uh, control tower had collapsed. The runway itself, the paving was all cracked. We found this Haitian guy who'd been hanging around at the airport offering his services as a fixer and driver. We hired him on the spot and got him to drive us into the city. Haiti, especially Port-au-Prince, is the worst possible place where you could have an earthquake because it's an overcrowded city. It's full of very cheaply constructed buildings, people living on top of one another, the buildings just collapsed. In the space of 30 seconds, there were over 200,000 people killed. There were just rows and rows and rows of bodies. And it was the worst thing I'd ever seen. The entire city was out on the street. The bodies that people had managed to drag from the fallen masonry had been laid out by the side of the road. There were people sleeping by the side of the road. This was the biggest story in the world at that moment. We were the only team covering that story at that point. Those first three days, we really just didn't sleep at all. There was a lot of anger in those first few days at the slow pace of the response. And there was a real problem with the bottleneck of humanitarian equipment and supplies at the airport. There were planes full of doctors that were being turned away, unable to land at the airport, and that made people extremely angry. There were still people trapped under the rubble, but a lot of the responders were not able to work at night because of security considerations. There is a, a stereotype of Haiti being a dangerous country, Haiti being a place where you will be at risk after dark on the streets. This was a country that had been hit by a devastating disaster. This was a time when, from what Haitians told us, the country had never been more united. From what we saw on the ground, there was very little basis for a concern about security. When I arrived in Haiti, I thought I would be there for maybe a week at the most, but I never left. I was there for the next 18 months. The situation for many months after the earthquake was really awful. There were one and a half million people living in tents around the outskirts of Port-au-Prince in terrible conditions, very unsanitary conditions. I think it was October the 20th in the evening when I first got a note from my news desk that was saying there had been an outbreak of a mystery disease in a town about two hours north of Port-au-Prince, a town called Saint-Marc. 19 people had been taken ill and died in a hospital in Haiti's rural heartland. When we arrived at the hospital, there were people being carried in on beds, people being carried in on doors. There were just streams of very sick, dying patients arriving at this tiny clinic. It was by far the worst thing we'd seen since the early days of the earthquake. You know, people were throwing up. There was diarrhea on the floor. It was just horrific. The hospital was so packed that there were people being locked out. They just didn't have the capacity to treat the numbers of patients arriving. There were people who were pretty much dead on arrival. If they didn't have access to fresh drinking water within about four or five hours, they were dying. It took several days before it was confirmed as cholera. It was Haiti's worst nightmare. It was just out of control and it was spreading and it was spreading very, very fast. The main fear that everybody had was that if this disease hit the capital, that there would be huge numbers of deaths. 
within that first week, we were back in the capital. You know, within the first half an hour, people were taking us from house to house, showing us sick relatives who were lying in bed, suffering from the same symptoms. The first few cases of cholera were basically taking place in front of us. We were seeing people bringing out their dead relatives, laying them on the street for body collectors to come and pick up and take away to mass graves. It was a full-blown epidemic that had spread to the capital. We were driving around the city listening to the local radio and there were people calling in, reporting that there was some kind of sewage spill that had taken place at a UN base just outside their town called Mirbalé. They were complaining that it had something to do with the outbreak of the disease. We drove along the side of the river that ran through the town until we got to this very small, fenced-off UN base that was actually the staging ground for the Nepalese contingent. We knocked on the gate to ask if we could go in. They didn't let us in. The front gate blocks off the base. You can't see inside. But if you go around the side, there's a kind of chain fence. And there's a small path between the edge of the base and the river that runs right next to the base. And that's a public path. I remember the first thing that we saw was about two dozen UN Nepalese peacekeepers frantically clearing up this putrid smelling mess that was leaking out of one of the buildings on the base. They were digging around this boggy patch of brown liquid that was smelt like sewage, and they were really upset that we were there, and they were telling us not to film. We could see this horrible smelling liquid dripping from the base, basically across the path into the river. What we were seeing right there was the smoking gun. Eventually, one of the guys started talking to me a little bit, and I was saying, what is this building? Can you tell me what this is? Is, is this a toilet? And he kind of looked back at the building and looked back to me and just kind of looked really guilty, and eventually he said, yeah, it's a toilet. I remember doing this very quick search on my phone for cholera outbreaks in Nepal. The first article that came up was talking about this major cholera outbreak that had happened that summer in Nepal. These guys that we'd seen clearing up this mess had freshly arrived from Nepal a couple of weeks ago. The first time that people had started to appear in these clinics suffering from the illness was, I think, about a week after that. So we started thinking about the timeline here. You get cholera from drinking contaminated water. And in Haiti, the sanitation infrastructure just isn't there. People get most of their water from the local river. So this was the river that had been contaminated. The Artiboni River feeds an entire region. It spreads throughout the, the rural heartland of Haiti, supplying all of these towns and villages with their water. People just drink from the river. For weeks after the outbreak happened, the Haitians were still drinking from that river. I mean, that is the only source of water that many Haitians have. The first thing we did was to call the UN and tell them what we'd seen and to ask them to comment on it. They wouldn't. We edited our footage in the car, made it into a, a short news report and just sent it off to our headquarters and got the story out. And it was the first time there had been any international coverage of a UN connection to cholera. By the time we left, they basically almost finished cleaning up this spill. So if we hadn't have been there and seen it, it might never have been known. In the end, the pressure kept building and it didn't go away. They had to send out a team of their own investigators to make an independent report about whether or not the UN did have a connection to the outbreak or not. When the report came out, it made headlines around the world because the investigators said that not only was there some basis in these reports about a UN link to the outbreak, they identified the area where the outbreak started as being the area next to the base. A few months after that report came out, the families got together and tried to get justice for you know, the loss of their relatives. They filed a lawsuit against the United Nations, asking for the UN to acknowledge responsibility and to pay compensation. The UN basically stonewalled them for over a year. We had to go all the way to UN headquarters in New York before we were able to get any official to speak to us on record. On the way, the UN finally came out with its response to the lawsuit. Their response was to dismiss it out of hand and basically claim immunity. So my interview with this deputy spokesperson was really just this kind of bizarre game of trying to ask the guy whether or not he thought the UN was liable and him basically reading the statement off a piece of paper and, and refusing to engage any more than that.
we went out of that interview down the corridors towards the Secretary General's office and tried to find officials on the way, more senior officials who could answer our questions. In the end, we were banned from the UN headquarters. We were told to leave the premises, not to come back. If the UN headquarters in New York had spilled sewage into the Hudson River, and if more than 8,300 New Yorkers had got sick and died as a consequence of that, I think it would be very difficult for the UN to avoid acknowledging responsibility for that. But somehow they managed to do that with Haiti.